Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. You know, one common question that I get from folks is, what is the difference between an insole frog and an electrofrog turnout? And that's been going on for years now. And recently, uh, Pico muddied the uh, mix a bit by adding the unifrog turnout to their line. So what I want to do today then is give you a look at each kind of turnout, the insole frog, the electrofrog, and the unifrog, go over how each one works, and also why the differences are important. What does it mean as far as operations for you on your model railroad? Before we go on, I want to ask you to take a moment to subscribe to the channel. It's simple, easy, and free. All you have to do is hit that little red uh, subscribe button, and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Thanks now. Okay, so I've got all three types of turnouts lined up here on the workbench. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the difference between these various types of turnouts. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look first here at the insole frog turnout. Now the insole frog is called an insole frog because the frog itself is insulated. It is totally isolated and it cannot be powered. And I'll talk more about the implications of that in just a second. But this turnout is, is what is called a power routing turnout. And the reason it's called that is because whichever way the points are set controls the power that flows through these rails here. And that is, is useful in some cases be, because it allows you to turn off or to turn power on to whichever route you want. So you can use these to route power to each one of these diverging legs of the uh, turnout uh, specifically. And, and, and that means that you can have a siding connected here, and once you throw power this way, then power to this set of tracks will be turned off. And conversely, when you throw it this way, the power will be routed through this diverging leg, and this will go unpowered. And that means that you could have a siding where you could set a locomotive, throw the turnout the other way, and power would be cut off over here, and this one would be uh, powered. And that was very useful in DC days because it, it very easily allowed you to turn off locomotives and be able to run another locomotive within the same block controlled by the same power supply. Now with DCC, we don't need that because we control each one of the decoders in the locomotives individually based on their address. So this is not something that is considered desirable anymore for DCC operations. It was very useful with DC operations. Okay, so then basically this using the points to pick up power from the, from the stock rails is really not a good idea for several reasons. And the reason I say that is, if you get something down in here between the point and the stock rail, such as some paint or a piece of ballast, a piece of scenery, ground foam, a piece of cat hair, whatever, any bit of dust, once you throw that, it can get in between and it can prevent that power pickup from occurring. So it is just based entirely on the physical contact between these two pieces of metal, and anything that prevents that physical contact is going to interrupt your electrical path, and you're not going to have power to any of this part of the turnout. So that's why these are really not uh, considered to be all that reliable of a uh, type of turnout uh, using that power routing method. Okay, if we look at our uh, frog here, as I said, this frog is not capable of being powered. The reason for that is you can see here it's cast in plastic. These two pieces here are metal, but they are independent, so you can't attach a wire to this one and power the frog, or to this one and power it, because they both would need it. Also, this little guy right here, that's a piece of plastic, so you're not going to be able to power that either. And that's important because it's a point where your locomotive is going to stall if it hits that spot. 
So really, you cannot power these guys. And as you can see, they don't provide any way to do that. These two wires here are simply the jumpers that connect the closure rails to the frog rails on the other side. So that guarantees that you do get power going through here to both frog rails from the closure rails and the point rails. Okay, so what, is, what does this mean then that this is not capable of being powered? Well, if you have a small locomotive, a lightweight locomotive, and particularly a steam locomotive, uh, they can stall out going through these unpowered frogs. Now, as you can see, this particular one is very, very short. And that's one of the, the ways that Pico uh, designed these to try to avoid locomotives stalling when going through the points. Is if you keep it short enough, it might just have enough momentum to go through here. However, as people, you know, constantly tell me, they get their locomotive stalling when going through these unpowered uh, frogs on these turnouts and other types of turnouts that use this same design. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look then at the electrofrogs. This here is a number six electrofrog turnout, and this is commonly what you would see used on a lot of model railroads uh, out on the main line, in the yards, everywhere. Uh, it is just, you know, sort of like the backbone of model railroads. Power pickup is right here at the points due to that physical. Uh, contact between the blades of the points here and the stock rails. So if you put it this way, power is going to be the same polarity all the way through here, including the frog itself. The good thing about it is that the frog is powered through this physical contact and through all of these rails being interconnected. And you can see right here on the back, there's a set of jumpers that run through underneath of the frog to the frog rails that keep them powered. Now the interesting thing about the electrofrog here is that it's set up so that you can convert it to what's called all live. And all live means that all of these rails are powered all the time and they would be of the correct polarity. So that makes them DCC friendly. And how does that work? Well, if you look right here on the back or on the underside of the turnout, there's a couple of jumpers right here. If you cut these jumpers here and then solder a jumper between this rail and this rail and this one and this one, then that will mean that right at this point you have a small gap where we cut those jumpers and that will isolate the frog portion of the turnout from the closure rails and the point rails. And by making that soldered connection between the stock rail and the closure rail on this side and on this side, then they will be powered all the time by this rail. So as long as this live, this rail here is live and powered, it will power this rail and this one uh, up to this point here and the same thing on this side. This uh, stock rail will power this closure rail and points right up to this point where we've got a little gap. And then the frog itself is one continuous unit up here. Now, that can be powered simply using this little wire here on the back because it is connected to your frog. So that allows you then to power this entire section through here using that one wire on the back of the underside of the turnout and this becomes the entire frog. So you've got a frog that is something on the order of three inches long. Uh, you still have the problem with the fact that both of these frog rails will be the same polarity. So you have to either put a gap in here or you have to provide insulated rail joiners at this point. Otherwise, you'll get the short. So it still comes with some of its own issues. But, you know, it does offer you the ability to use all live. And that means that you can control the phase or polarity of the frog itself by connecting this wire here to a reversing setup on a tortoise switch machine, on an IP digital switch machine, or by using a, a frog juicer, for example. Now, one of the, the real uh, problems or limitations with the electrofrog uh, turnout is that out of the package, it's not DCC friendly. And the reason for that is all of these rails are interconnected. So when you have the blade of the points against this stock rail, everything in here is going to be the same polarity as this stock rail. 
Consequently, if a car with metal wheels or a locomotive comes through here and derails and the wheel falls down here uh, in between the blade and the stock rail, this is going to be opposite polarity of this and you're going to get a dead short. So that's always a problem with these. Another issue is that right here, the two frog rails at this end are the same polarity. You always have to leave, either leave a gap between these two rails and the running rails that they would be attached to, or put in insulated uh, rail joiners here. That still creates a problem because let's say that the turnout is set for this route and a locomotive comes down this way. Well, it's going to uh, have the polarity set against it too, and as soon as it crosses the gap, it's going to create a short right here. And, and that's a real problem. And what you, want it to be, what you want to be able to do, obviously, is to isolate these two frog rails. And that's what I always do, and what I've shown in uh, previous videos, is that I may make a cut here and a cut here, isolate the frog, and power route it separately. Now, one thing you can do is, if you do not cut these two jumpers and isolate the frog, then what you can do is make a cut right here, and right here. And that will isolate the frog with those two cuts. It will leave these two rails, the two frog rails, free and uh, independent so they can be attached directly to the running rails on their legs. And that will also uh, electrically isolate the two closure rails and point rails from one another. And they have given you a way of powering those they left a gap here between the ties, so you can solder a jumper here to here and here to here, and that's going to provide power from the adjacent stock rails to the closure rail and the points. So it makes it a DCC friendly turnout very quickly and easily by doing those changes. And I'll put a link to the video where I went into more depth on how to do that. But the Unifrog turnout does that for you already, so I really recommend, if you can find the uh, size turnout that you need in the Unifrog uh, configuration, purchase these. Don't bother with the old Inselfrog and the old Electrofrog. Go with the Unifrog. It's the best of both worlds. Now, if we then loop move on to the Unifrog, let's take a look at this one. I covered this in some depth in a video recently, and I'll put a link to that above me right above my left shoulder here. But at any rate, you can see that we've got this nice track geometry. It's a one piece, a continuous rail, the, stop, the closure rail and the points. So it gives you a very nice smooth movement through the points here. Now, in addition to that, the frog here is isolated. We have a insulating uh, piece of plastic here that isolates the frog at this end. And then we have a small gap right here that's very difficult to see unless you're very close to it. I can barely see it myself. But that also uh, isolates the frog at this end. In addition, these two rails are isolated themselves. And there's a pair of jumpers that have been attached that provide power from this stock rail to this frog rail, and this stock rail to this frog rail. So these two guys are the correct polarity. Uh, there will be no problem with locomotives creeping up close to the frog and creating a short circuit. They could get this close to that frog before they could create a short circuit. And that's not likely to happen unless they're actually moving through the entire turnout. So that's one of the great things about this. It, uh, it's very easy to use in that respect. But, you know, you could use it as a power routing turnout. And right here you can see that they've connected the stock rail uh, to this closure rail, point rail combination, and on this side to this stock rail, point rail. So the closure rail, point rail combinations will always be powered uh, independent of this physical contact here at the point blades themselves. So it really is a good solution, a very good uh, turnout development that Pico has come up with. So the Unifrog incorporates the best of both worlds, the Inselfrog and the Electrofrog. You can either power the frog or leave it unpowered, whichever way you like it. 
And because it is a very short uh, frog right here, similar to the insole frog, there's less of a chance of locomotive stalling there. However, you can still have it happen, particularly if you're using short wheelbase diesels or steam locomotives for switching. They're going to be moving through at slow speeds, so you can have stalling on an unpowered frog. So that's something to keep in mind. You always, if you can, always want to power your frogs. I think you'll find that the Unifrog is going to be a much, much better choice for you than either an Insel Frog or the old Electro Frog. Because everything that, you know, I consider wrong with this one and not DCC friendly has been fixed in this particular case. You're not as likely to have any short circuits that are going to shut down your DCC command station if these are properly wired and installed following the instructions provided by Pico. Well, that's a wrap for today's video on these three types of turnouts, the Ensel Frog, the Electro Frog, and the Unifrog. So hopefully that'll get you straight as to which ones you want to use on your model railroad and why you want to pick specific ones for use. Now, of course, the Ensel Frog and the Electro Frog are not long for this world, but fortunately, the Unifrog takes the best of both of these and puts it into one turnout. So you don't have to lose one or the other here. You only have to buy one turnout to do both functions. So have a great week, have a great weekend, and enjoy the holiday if you're here in the U.S. And uh, we'll see you here next week with another video from the DCC Guide. Bye now.